you know how it works around here. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the best thing in hands. Well, thank you. Please. For the time. Um, so, I'm Eric Schmidt. I'm Vice President of uh, Asset Management at Housing Vermont. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Housing Vermont is a uh, nonprofit developer of affordable rental housing. Uh, we partner with a lot of local nonprofits throughout the state. Um, and uh, in, in that partnership with the, the local nonprofits, we've developed 5,800 apartments. That's our inception in 1988. Um, in that process, with, with the support and help of VHCD, um, we've been able to leverage and uh, raise over $300 million in private equity through the Affordable Housing Tax Credit Program. It's a federal IRS program. Um, we've also uh, raised over $400 million in private financing uh, and public investment. And Vermont Housing Con Conservation Board has been a, a very large part of that public investment. And uh, I want to you know, thank you all for your support of VHCB as well. Um, my job as Vice President of Asset Management is to assure the long-term uh, operational health of the portfolio. So we develop the affordable housing, but we also own it for a minimum of 15 years. Um, so I'm always looking for ways to make sure that the, the property is run well and it looks good and it's, uh, it's you know, uh, financially sound. And so I'm, looking, I'm looking at the long term. I'm, I'm a little bit more of a long, take a look at the long term outlook and what, what can we do to con control costs. Um, so I'm, I'm just here to, I'm, I want to describe some of the energy work that we've done uh, to help control those costs. Um, what we, how we've been developing uh, our properties. Uh, one of the most interesting and most innovative aspects of this that we've been working on is using technology and data to give us feedback on how we're doing um, and, and guiding our work. Um, so, but first of all, uh, in the, within the portfolio, we've been investing in a lot of renewables. Um, it's the renewables, will, renewables are reducing our reliance on fossil fuels, propane, fuel oil, those that have a lot of <coughs> but also just you know reducing our trying to reduce our footprint as much as possible. Uh, and to date, we've uh, installed um, ten solar voltaic voltaic systems serving 622 apartments. Ten, uh, 21 biomass, which is pellets and wood chips systems, uh, serving over 686 apartments. 31 domestic hot water systems serving 756 apartments. And we're starting to look at the new technology of the high efficiency air source heat pumps. And again, what's, what's critical with that is we're installing the systems, or we're not just installing them and saying, okay, the model worked and our, our costs are, are good. We're really acquiring Data. These these air source heat pumps have built-in intelligence, and it brings it feeds data out. And we we take that data, we put it on a, a cloud server software that we've developed, and it's and it drives visual dashboards that we look at that really tell us is this system optimized? Is it working the way that it should? Um, another uh, a more recent example uh, in. Uh, is an energy conservation project we completed in Apple, at Applegate Apartments in Bennington. Um, the property consists of 104 apartments and 23 buildings. Um, we converted all 23 boilers to one central wood chip heating plant. Um, and that, that the, the wood chip heating plant is in a, a separate building and it distributes the heat throughout all of the buildings on the site. How many boilers? 23 buildings. 23 boilers. There was, each there was each 23 fuel oil boilers. Have a, a single yes. boiler. Yes. Yeah. That resulted in, there's a picture of it actually over here when I walked in, I saw it. Um, that resulted in a, a reduction in, in energy cost or fuel cost um, from hundred average of $165,000 a year to $50,000 a year. It was an incredible reduction. Okay, that was work your lobbyist to prepare us. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> That's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I should have asked before, <laughs> but uh, uh, okay. So this uh, central heating biomass plant that you put in, um, were you able to get any help from? Uh, I guess it would be Green Mountain Power or whoever whoever is your electric provider in downtown. Um, 
Uh, you know, I'm not entirely sure. I'm not on the development side. Oh, okay. Um, so, what, you know, the development side puts together all the financing sources. Mm -hmm. I'm after it's developed, and then I take care of it for the 15-year compliance period and make sure that all 150 separate uh, affordable housing entities that own right now in operations 4,000 units um, are, are running smoothly. You referred to the 15-year period a number of times. I'm not really clear on the, that's the financing period. The, our major, one of our major sources of financing is the federal low-income housing tax credit, um, and the that credit com, there's a compliance period, which is a key component. We have to maintain compliance with IRS regulations for 15 years, and so we stay in the deal with our local partner for at least 15 years to, to see it through to make sure it's sustain it's sustainable and stays in compliance with IRS. Do you excuse me just for the question. Do you typically sell right after after the 15 year period has been fulfilled? It, it all depends. We we typically the local partner will steward the, the property beyond that period. So our local nonprofit will continue to own it and it continues to remain affordable. Excuse me, sir. Um, I've got Warren next in the mic. So you were putting in uh, units and using heat pumps, you said. So, so say uh, Vermont, December, any January, still gets very cold. My understanding is that heat pumps are, cannot produce the heat then or not, or if they. So, uh, no, I think we're finding, we are finding that our building envelopes that we're building. Are, are performing very well. Our shells are so good that our the Mitsubishi's that we're putting in now, not just Mitsubishi, Dakins or other air source heat pumps, are performing. So, is there any backup system or not, or is that just it? Just one system to heat? No, we would. We do put in some form of backup right now until again until we gather more intelligence and understand how it's performing. Typically, what would that backup be then? A re resistance electric. It's, we we're trying to figure out what's working better. So, it, what? So, what sort of analysis? What percentage of the time do they need to use resistance heats? Or you don't have the numbers yet. We have found that even in some buildings that are, the shell isn't that wet, performing that well that they are heating up. They're doing what they're supposed to. Do. So, that's what we're finding right now. They're not as efficient. Their coefficients of performance is not as, as good, so it's you know they're working much harder than, than they should have to, but they are keeping up. So they're so it's a matter of the efficiency so goes down as the temperature goes down, but they haven't had to cut over to the backup system. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. And then yeah, and we're learning you know so if that's the case, if their efficiency is going down, should be should we put in a control aspect that says okay, switch over to the more efficient system. And which is the electric resistance. Really, the electric could, resistance could be more We're still learning, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Mike? Yeah, um, back to that central heating biomass plant. We put in uh, to replace 23 boilers. What was the fuel source for the 23 boilers? It was fuel oil. Fuel oil? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. And again, what, uh, another aspect. So what we've been doing is gathering data from our, our, our existing portfolio. Mm -hmm. And when we were in the design phase of this project, the originally the original design of the of the of the pellet boiler was uh, 3.2 million BTUs. Um, we took information from our portfolio and shared it with our design team, and uh, were able to get the design team to reduce the size of the boiler plant by 50 percent, the 1.8 million BTUs. That saved us $200,000 in capital costs. Um, and also by right sizing that boiler, the boiler's going to last longer because if you have an oversized boiler, you short cycle, you keep excessively cycling on your boilers, and that will that reduces your efficiency, and it, it causes your boilers to uh, fail prematurely. Robin, um, I wonder to find out more about the, the solar arrays that you're using, mm -hmm. um, and I know you're not on the development side, but. Um, are those typically developed by a private developer who utilizes tax credits and then bought, seeded? Do you, you know, what's the, what's right. the I'm not 100 percent sure, but I believe that we've partnered with some of these ventures. Mm -hmm. um, but we have also done one on our own, I believe. And, and 
but we have, and we have been able to, I believe we've been able to syndicate the credit on our own. And these are group net meter in? Yeah, so we have, like, yeah, we have three, meters. right now we have three large solar arrays, one 500 kilowatt and 250 are close to it right now. And those are, those we net meter back to uh, partnerships that we, we call on. Uh, so again, it's a, it's a way of controlling the cost within our, within our partnerships. Um, and and the, out of the three, we're we're able to save ten percent on those electrical bills on, in those partner uh, partnerships, uh, which is out of the three is like twenty five thousand dollars a year. So nice. Yeah. And are the are those solar panels uh, roof mounted or ground mounted? Those are ground mounted. The ground. The mounted. three. The the ten that I saw. So the are ten are, are roof mounted. Okay. Ten are roof mounted. And then three are solar arrays in the field. And are are they on your prop, on, um, I should say, the uh, the property of the housing, or are we they, have one are you is? buying into a, uh, an array developed by somebody else, someplace else? Right. So we have one that is in our housing. We have, you know, ex some excess land that we're able to do it, and then the other one is on other land, hmm. not of the housing. Um, share an, another example, a, a very innovative example. Uh, we just finished a project down in Brattleboro, Red Clover Commons, it's 55 units of elderly housing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 79,000 square foot building. We did a geothermal system. It's our first geothermal system, which takes advantage of you know, the ground heat. And again, uh, this we had our data acquisition system in there um, and found that uh, at the onset, the system was not working as it was intended. And we took actions to smooth out uh, the operations. And I think, it's, for me, it, to just I can't drive home enough. We've we've been pushing energy efficiency. Let's get this stuff into our buildings. But if we don't know and we don't monitor, we can't just set it and forget it. We got to monitor on a basis. Otherwise, uh, we're not realizing all of it. Um, I don't know if you can provide this off the top of your head. But, um, obviously, you're working to make your your units efficient, healthy, affordable, all of that. Do you have any information on turnover rate or of, of uh, residents, of tenants, in your housing units as opposed to? It, it varies from year to year. We, yeah, um, it varies from year to year. A, a typical turnover rate uh, is around 20%, 15 to 20%. Mm -hmm. And we just, we just looked at our entire portfolio uh, for evictions which was very interesting. And, um, we had, out of 3,800 <coughs> apartments that I collected information on, we had only 81 evictions, a 2.2% eviction rate. So I think that, you know our folks are doing a really good job to try and make our residents, our, allow our residents to succeed, do everything we can. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, driving down energy costs is, is keeping, that's our main goal, is to maintain affordability for the residents. And I, I assume that the, um, the dashboard is the dashboard on the internet, not using your accessing it by internet. Or? Yeah, so we, we've, we're in the process of finalizing our this platform. Um, it's we've got our hardware is, is solid that's going into the sites. Our data that's on the cloud, uh, the software we developed for that is, is is solid. Now we're integrating online web access to the dashboards. This is just intellectually the interest in it, but. When you get that up and going, mm -hmm. if it can be shown on on uh, uh, just a computer screen, we'd love to have you back and yeah. I'd, I'd like to, to see the- I can provide you with examples of how we, yeah, we've, you learned we've saved it. a lot, we've learned a lot. We're talking with other national housing groups about the benefit of this. It's so surprising when you plug this into a building how most of, our, most of the stuff that we've plugged into, we've found ways that First of all, it's the, the, the equipment's not talking to each other the way it should. It's not working the way it should. So having this uh, data is really making sure that you know we're maximizing, we're optimizing our systems. Um, it's great we're investing in energy, but this is like a really key component to making sure that it's you know serving serving us well. We're, so I'm a bit curious how granular 
is this information and is there privacy issues of how much uh, I'm not using electricity, maybe I'm not home and some Yeah, no, we're not going into you know, unit by unit information. No. This is building aggregate data. Uh, that, and that's the beauty of it as well, is we can get aggregate total electrical usage on our buildings without imposing so, anything on uh, it. say McKnight Lane, there's what, mm -hmm. two units to a building now. Uh, that's rather granular, isn't it? Yeah, the, the, right. It's, so this platform would really be uh, more suitable for a building that is uh, at least 12 units, okay. a 10,000 square foot building and larger. Um, we probably would do one-offs to try and understand <coughs> how those smaller Vermods are working at McKnight Lane and other properties that are smaller, just to see how they're working, but we wouldn't put it into every one of them. So this is feeding back to a central database on what basis hourly or? We get minute by minute data on every data point that we're gathering. And we've got 65 million data points sent there at any given time. So it has to be some sort of internet connected uh, facility? Yes, yeah, and, and that's another thing. We're trying to get Wi-Fi into all of our buildings. So we really think there's a huge benefit to giving access to Wi-Fi for, for our residents to, so that they can access you know, educational needs, um, services. Um, so you know, we're taking advantage of all that. Yeah, I was going to ask a question along the same lines. Uh, so Vermont Housing is actually doing the monitoring, not the individual buildings. Correct. Building managers or whatever. Right. And we have the in-house analysts that looks at this. Right. OK. And the individual buildings, so individual <laughs> projects, the housing projects, those are independent of Housing Vermont, right? Or we co-own those. You co-own them. Yes. Oh, okay. All yeah. right. For the 15-year, at, at minimum 15 years. 15 years, years. okay. Yes. So it's cool. Yeah. <coughs> we thank you very much. Okay. We appreciate it. We'd thank like you. to follow up sometime. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Nick? Yeah, hi. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for being yeah. here. Good, for morning, good morning, still. Um, so I'll just uh, I'll say my name for the record. This is Nick Richardson. I'm the president of the Vermont Land Trust. Um, just recently assumed that role. It's really good to be with you today. Um, so, yes. Um, you have Gus's job? <laughs> no, Gus, Gus runs the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, and uh, he's still doing that. I, I took over from Gil Livingston, who was our huh. former president. Yeah. Um, so it's great oh, to the land trust. The land trust. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Never so, mind. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your stick for the stickers. Um, I see that you're wearing one and yeah. represented in fantastic. Well, I can take this out. Uh, <laughs> great, Robin. Robin. Um, so, and I'll just say, um, you know, it's great to be here. And nothing, if nothing else, right? We're very excited to be here on the Vermont Housing Conservation Coalition Day. It's a wonderful day for us at the land trust, but really for our whole our whole community. Um, I'm excited to hear Eric's presentation around what's happening in energy. Um, we do work closely together. We have shared values and shared goals about um, what we're trying to do for this state and how we want to take it forward. Um, that's both professional and personal. My, my wife, Smith, I don't actually work in the housing for a lot. I just started with her a couple years ago on the development side. Um, so we really appreciate that work. I also know that we're behind schedule and Representative Yantachka was showing us the board and all the work that you all have to do. So I'm. I have 15 minutes, I'm happy to just talk for a few about some of the work that we're doing and then answer any questions that you have. Um, I, we'll I, probably interrupt as you go. Good, right? great, <laughs> great. Um, so I did, and there, there is a presentation which I think could just be available to you um, as a follow-up. It's a, it's a useful kind of reference piece. I came in last year and spoke with this committee uh, largely about the renewable energy work that we were doing, so how the Vermont Land Trust was helping to facilitate um, smart and well-scaled renewable energy development on farms and forested parcels across Vermont. Um, I also mentioned at that point that we were developing, and we were in the very early stages of developing a project to look at the potential for forest carbon offsets in Vermont. Um, forest carbon offsets are using um, the using the growth of wood in Vermont that sequesters carbon as a way to generate revenue by um, essentially selling that, that sequestered carbon into markets of different kinds. And it's, um, it's an industry and an area that's really taken off in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, first with the establishment of the California compliance market, um, which happened about 10 years ago. 
Um, but there's also a, a, another set of voluntary markets that are in play. Um, so it's a really interesting opportunity, a way to compensate landowners for allowing a portion of their woods or managing in such a way that their woods continue to store carbon even while they're, they're managing for timber and other things. Um, and that could generate revenue that could help to support um, forest landowners to maintain their lands uh, as really, really effective um, and healthy working forests. So it's something we're really excited about. We've done an analysis project over the last year working with um, some pretty sophisticated modeling firms that are based uh, out of California and do some work in that California compliance market. We've also been really grateful to have the support of Professor Bill Keaton, uh, who is at UVM and is an internationally regarded forestry consultant and ecologist. And we've looked at this together. Bill is on the board, our board at the Vermont Land Trust. So we spent, spent this year in partnership really looking at I mean, what would this look like to try and, and do forest carbon in Vermont. And one of the challenges that we find, which is a challenge we often have here in Vermont, is that we're small. And what I mean by that in the forest sense is that our forest parcels tend to be small. The average forest parcel ownership in Vermont is about 150 acres. Um, and typically, uh, a commercially viable forest carbon project takes place on a project, a parcel that's 3,000 acres or larger. So that's a really big difference, right? We have a landscape that is 80% forested, largely privately owned, largely in small parcels. So a lot of the potential benefit and opportunity around carbon isn't accessible to the people who own this land and manage it on behalf of all of us, right? That's the sort of challenge that we face. Uh, so we were looking very closely at that. And I think we're, we're excited as the results of this analysis are such that we feel like uh, we can uh, come up with a program that will allow us to aggregate small landowners in Vermont into forest carbon offset projects. And we're, we believe in that strongly enough that we're actually going ahead with a demonstration project this year. Um, I, I cannot identify yet the place that it's happening. Uh, not that we haven't identified it, we have, but we're you know, still doing the work to get it set up. Um, but we will be moving ahead. Our partnership, which involves um, some key staff of the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, they've been incredible partners, funders, and supporters along this project. Bill Keaton, myself, other folks at the Land Trust, the Nature Conservancy. So we've got this really broad-based partnership that's coming together to try and crack this problem for Vermont so that we can have what other states in our area have. Um, you know, this, these projects are happening in New York, they're happening in New Hampshire, they're happening in Maine. Very few of them are happening now in Vermont, so we want to make this opportunity available to folks. So that's that's the high level. I, there's a lot of detail below that that I, I would go into another time, but Appreciate I just want to sort of end there. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to talk to you about that last session I introduced to sponsor to Bill Great. on uh, forest carbon sequestration and our efforts toward, toward state land, trying to reach that large parcel size. Sure, sure. Um, and so I know some of the complexities, yeah. but I'd be happy to interested in following up with you on, on Great. The, the private side. Great. That, yeah. So. Yeah, and that is really where we're focused is private landowners at this point. Mike. Yeah. yeah, so I'm also interested in how that works. And um, you said you had a presentation that's available. Yeah, I brought it today. It's just lengthy, and it could just on be, your web. It could just it's be made on, available. It's on our website? Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's what I was Should wondering. Be. Yeah. And I'm happy to answer, you know, if you want to take a look get in contact way. with us, we can definitely follow up. We're also, there's a there's a larger report that's actually going to be um, published and released in the next couple of weeks um, that I'll make sure is available to you all. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. I guess I have the same question, but I wonder if, if maybe in just uh, a few sentences you can tell us sure. what is a, a project yes. other than leaving the trees yes. in, in the forest to keep the carbon yeah, so right, when I say project, um, it's really, this is really a, um, it's a way of describing how you would set up a, a forest to be managed for carbon, as par car with carbon being one of the things that you're managing for over the long term. And then the project, the project component is that you then make a binding commitment to manage in that way, and that there's a, there's money that, get, that changes hands, you're given, you're, you're paid uh, to you're, you're paid for the value of those credits by somebody else. And so it's really the project piece is really about is aligning the management practices of that parcel going forward such that you're sequestering carbon in it over the long term and then you're compensated for the carbon that you're sequestering. It doesn't mean to not manage. And I think this is one of the things that people, this is one of the sort of fallacies that's out there um, and, the, and the, the assumptions that are, that's wrong about forest carbon. 
having a forest carbon project doesn't mean that you don't cut the trees. It means that you manage in such a way that you're growing the carbon in your woods over time. So it does actually go along very well with management. And what we've seen is that it actually matches very well with the management practices that a lot of people have in Vermont. Because very few of us are cutting to the fully allowable cut in our forests. So it's a, um, anyway, I'm not, I'm, I answered your question and went off, but I, um, I think that's a really important point. And, I, and if people in the room take away nothing else, when you're, do, when you're doing forest carbon, you can also be managing for timber, and that's the scenario that we envision in Vermont's forest. So there are some things you would do that have to do with the carbon. That, are, that you might not necessarily be doing in otherwise sustainable I think, forestry. I think that's right. Yeah, you could have you could have um, potentially sustainable forestry yeah. management practices without a forest carbon project, but there are certain ways that you would manage around forest carbon. That would, different things. It's slightly different, but in yeah. my view, you know, I think the nice thing about carbon is that it's actually a nice proxy for sustainable management. When you manage for carbon, you're also man you typically are managing for species biodiversity. You're managing for water resilience. You're, you're managing for climate change. So it um, has a lot of values beyond the carbon itself. Mike. So how much more carbon sequestration would you get from a managed forest than uh, just allowing everything to grow? Um, there, uh, it's, it's hard to answer that question because it depends a lot on what your management practices would be. I think that the key around carbon is that you're committing to those practices for a long period of time, right? So in the voluntary market, it's 40 years. In, a, um, in the compliance market, it's 100 years. So one thing that we find compelling about this, and a lot of landowners actually that we've been talking to are finding compelling about it, is that it's a way that in addition to perhaps a conservation easement or just to their own values around how they manage their forests, it's a way to ensure that those values continue for a period of time into the future. Um, and uh, the, the honest answer to your question, uh, Mike, is I, I'm not sure that we're going to radically change the amount of carbon that's being sequestered in our woods by having more people manage for carbon. Um, but we will be able to release uh, revenue for those folks that are going to help them to do that, help to support those kinds of management practices that help make Vermont what we want it to be. Um, so it's, I, for me, it's less about changing the overall approach and sequestering more carbon. It's more about um, finding a way to recognize and continue to, to provide revenue that's going to support that kind of management into the future in a time when the timber industry is facing a lot of difficulty and we're seeing people you know, challenged to uh, manage the forests in the way that I'd like to because of what's happening in the, in the wood markets right now. And who would pay for the credits? I mean, uh, who, would, who would pay for this? There are, there are a wide variety of buyers. So if it's a compliance market, you're, you're paying into the California system, which is essentially energy companies in California that are required to buy credits. Or there are um, corporate clients that are interested in buying credits. It's a very, it's a very strong market, so we're not, we're not concerned on the market side. We'd love to see Vermont companies do more buying of carbon credits. Um, it's, that's been something that's been very challenging to kind of fit in. In fact, other folks have failed in the past because they focused on developing carbon projects and also trying to attract a Vermont buyer at the same time. We hope that will come. Warren, a quick question about the managed forest. Uh, it would, seems to me that if you're managing it and harvesting, you have biomass, you have the advantage of producing heat, that otherwise if you just let it sit there, it's just going to decompose and turn to carbon anyway. But right. if you'd be able to utilize the energy and offset some other fuel, is that part of the equation of this? Or? It can be. You know, I, I'd say the Vermont Land Trust are very supportive of biomass. We work very closely with the Northern Forest Center and other organizations that are trying to promote the use of sustainable biomass, biomass that's harvested locally mm -hmm. um, and doesn't travel great distances before it's burned, and that that's also done, that that, that that biomass comes off of forests or it's managed in such a way that you're really doing it in a, you know, maybe not net zero, but you're doing it in a way that, it's really, um, that is really sustainable over the long term. Um, I think the challenges around biomass are more about making the market happen, making sure that there are enough people who are interested in buying it, um, that it becomes cost effective to um, get it out of the woods at scale. And again, I think you know, um, forest carbon and biomass can fit together on the same parcel. This is the thing that we've learned through this analysis. You don't have to trade them off. You can manage for carbon across your woods and also pull a lot of, you can pull a lot of wood out. Um, that can be used for biomass or other applications. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very Thanks much so for your help. Yeah, it's great to be here with you today. I think Thank we you. should try to get back here. Is Representative Sheldon here? Oh, 
help her represent Wood is. You're next on the list. You were the next call I was going to make. Excuse me. Good morning. How are you? Thank you, Representative Teresa Wood, for the record. Uh, I am here to give you a very brief two sentence overview of H 429. Uh, and then I brought with me Renee Pellerin, um, who uh, would like to say a few words about the importance of this bill. Um, so, essentially, this bill does two things um, it uh, creates a, com a communication facilitator program. Uh, and I'm going to let Renee speak a little bit. Um, about that and the impact about that for people who are deafblind. And um, the other thing that it does is in relationship to um, the Department of Public Service, um, there is a telecommunications relay advisory um, council. And that council has uh, is currently chaired by uh, somebody designated by the uh, Commissioner of Public Service. Um, and, uh, or no, excuse me, by the Commissioner. Um, of public service. And so this proposal is to have um, the council elect a chair from its non-state representatives, so the, the non-state government people um, who are appointed to the council, and then um, to have um, the, the council elect that chair and the representative from the Department of Public Service serving as the um, vice chair. Um, and uh, this is done primarily to represent the impact of these services on individuals who need this type of assistance in order to communicate with uh, other individuals and the importance of having uh, consumer representation on this board and consumer um, uh, leadership uh, on this board. And um, from what I understand from uh, Renee, that there, there has been in not necessarily what we would call um, regularly scheduled meetings of this council, um, and I feel that's very important. So um, with regard to the Communication Facilitator Program, that's the um, section um, F uh, on page 5 of the bill. Um, and I'm going to, as I said, let Renee talk a little bit about that, but it's, it's a way for individuals who are deafblind to be able to use the system more effectively. Um, they are, um, are not a huge number of people in this situation, but um, having one person who's not able to communicate with uh, another individual that they need to communicate with is important. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Renee, if that's okay with you. Please do. interpreter and also uh, my uh, support person here. I'm um, uh, actually going to use some low technology today and provide you with a hard copy of um, <laughs> my testimony. Thank you. So I would like to first of all uh, thank Representative Wood for sponsoring this bill uh, for me because just to let you know, I've been involved um, with the telephone communication, tele telecommunication bill service since its founding, its inception, um, many years ago. And basically the bill is talking, we're talking about two sections within the bill. One talks about deafblind individuals and their access to tele telecommunication services. 
think the technology has been incredible in terms of the recent developments. Um, and sadly, deaf-blind individuals cannot access that technology as other deaf people do. Deaf and hard of hearing folks um, can use the technology quite easily, but it's very frustrating for a person who is deaf and also blind. So the bill is asking to establish a program of communication facilitators to allow deaf-blind individuals to access the visual part of this program. Um, there's certainly um, programs in other states now, and they're called these positions in terms of a person providing that uh, facilitation when a deaf-blind person is using a video phone um, are established have been established in other states. So, and certainly you might be have heard of communication facilitators for individuals who have autism. And so this is a, a similar kind of assistance for people who are deaf-blind providing access uh, to a deaf-blind person who cannot see the screen and see the person signing on the screen. So this would be an amendment to the uh, current uh, VTRS, the Vermont Telecommunications Relay Services Bill law. And this would specifically serve deaf-blind individuals and their access. The, the, the way communication facilitators could be supported would be th uh, through the surcharge on our telephone bills, which is already established. And um, this would also, providing this communication facilitation program would reduce the isolation of deaf-blind people who are quite isolated and live scattered throughout the state of Vermont. The communication facilitator would um, actually go to the person, deaf-blind person's house and would have been booked for an hour or a couple of hours so that the deaf-blind person could uh, tra transact their phone calls through a video phone and that communication facilitator would sign to the deaf-blind person what the person on the screen is signing so that they, and that, that would happen tactily so that people would have equal access to telecommunication communication. And you know, it would it would add an element to deaf-blind people's lives in terms of being able to connect with people out there, which they can't do through the telephone anymore, through video phones anymore, because they cannot see. And so this would help reduce the isolate, extreme isolation of people living here in Vermont. Um, I can give you a little more detail in terms of how what this looks like in terms of a setup. So I have a video phone at home on a computer screen and with a webcam, and I can trans I can make a call to somebody else, a deaf person, or call a relay service with an interpreter, who then connects my phone call to whoever I'm trying to call, and <clears throat> then so that person <coughs> appears on the screen. My communication facilitator would sign to me tactily what um, the person is saying on the screen. I can then respond, signing myself, to the person on the screen. Now, the, the size of the deaf-blind population here in Vermont is very, very small. And as I said before, they live all around the state in very isolated areas. So that would be the communication facilitator part of this bill. Uh, and, um, Representative Wood mentioned the BTRS Advisory Council. I have been one of its founding members. <clears throat> I was on, in the first group of people who were serving on that advisory council. And, um, you know, I served my term, I stepped down, and then I became legally blind over the years. So I approached the Department of Public Service and asked for uh, an amendment. Uh, around uh, communication access for deaf-blind folks. We talked about that. I talked about that with the Department of Public Service and realized they hadn't had a meeting of the Advisory Council for three years, the Vermont Telecommunications Advisory Council, which is in violation of the law. They are supposed to meet quarterly, four times a year. And I didn't get a clear answer as to why the, the council had not been meeting. So I took it upon myself to um, uh, say I would be happy to jo rejoin the council to help get it up and running again. And as I've been going through this pro process, I've realized there's a real leadership problem and an organizational problem. It hasn't, the organizational part of this has not been great. So I've 
given it some thought, and I uh, contacted the head of the department and didn't get a clear answer. And at that point, I decided uh, to see if we could change the structure of the council through the law. And instead of having um, the Department of Public Service be the chair of chairperson for the, the council, that a person could be elected from the non-governmental members, such as a deaf blind, a deaf person, a hard of hearing person, a speech impaired person, could, could be elected as the chairperson. So that is the second amendment that we're asking for in this bill. And that would then also empower the consumers um, to be running this uh, advisory council, and I think it would be very beneficial. So I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please feel free. I got Laura first, then Robin, and then Mike. <laughs> so, Laura, I'm Laura Sibilia. Yes. And so, my question is um, I see the testimony and that this is a limited. I have to wait. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Okay. Um, that there are a limited number of deaf blind. Do we have, do we have an idea of how many um, Vermonters are deaf blind? As I said, yes, it is a very small number, probably 25 or less. Okay. And they're pro out of that 25, probably 15 would have received the most benefit from using a communication facilitator. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Robin, um, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, my question is, how many? Do you have an idea how many facilitators would be needed since? the individuals live all over or widely scattered. I honestly, I don't know yet um, how many communication facilitators we need. Uh, my suggestion would be look for um, individuals who are very skilled in specific areas around the state so that we would save money on travel and really get people who are local to the deafblind person in that area. I would say perhaps perhaps 10 total, something like that. Okay, thank you. Mike. Um, yeah, my questions have been asked by Laura and Robin. Okay. Warren. Uh, So, can your facilitator be uh, computerized? Can can a video see what you're doing and translate that into speech and speech to something that you can get in Braille and hold on and uh, be able to know what I'm saying? Uh, not that I don't enjoy having her here, but it's maybe easier if we have a computer system rather than having people going around the state. Is there computer systems to do that? They do a lot lately, I right hear. Don't they? <laughs> I think she's trying to translate you, but she's saying. The computers aren't smart enough yet to help me. <laughs> There's not technology that would do it. Okay. However, there are folks out there who are trying to um, create some software. So that software will allow me to sign uh, and be to a camera. It would be uh, videoed. And then one could uh, receive a printed text copy of what I have said. And that would not work for everyone. But the software actually isn't ready yet. It's in development. It's in a beta stage for development. And I've uh, seen one of those, uh, one, uh, I've seen the beta version, and it's expensive. Um, I don't think it's really effective yet, it's, and I would have a concern around individuals who, who are not skilled in uh, English. There are f folks for whom English is their second language, deaf, blind folks for whom English is their second language, ASL is their first language, American Sign Language. 
And so that program wouldn't necessarily benefit them because they would have be having to deal with their second language in terms of English if something were printed in English text. Um, Mike. Yeah. Um, are there printers? Oh, wait. Are there printers that, that print in Braille? Are you talking about the software I was just speaking about, or just in general? Or well, in, well, in general, I, I'm just wondering if printers are available right now that print in Braille. From spoken language or sign language or what? The, uh, uh, from text on a screen or. So yes, text on a screen could be converted to Braille. There's quite a bit of technology out there. For uh, a blind person who uses Braille, can certainly access text uh, that can be converted from text on a screen to Braille. I am not a Braille user. Um, I, at the moment, use uh, Zoom Text, which is a software program that enlarges text to a large font. Um, so. And so Braille, would, there's no technology yet either that from Braille converting it to a signed Sign language, um, right. version is not ready yet. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much for your testimony. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry, Rob. Uh, Bob? Uh, mm -hmm. My question would be, this service is just not available through the telecommunications, telecommunications relay service or they're just not acting on it? Here in Vermont, there is not a service, a communicate, communication facility, facilitator service through the relay service at the moment. Not here in Vermont. I might add, if, there, if the advisory council had met in the last three years, they might have recommended something like this to the department that the department maybe could have investigated. However, that hasn't happened. Just, if I could, one last comment. If I could make a, a suggestion or a recommendation to the Vermont Telecommunications Relay Service, um, if it's passed, uh, you know, I think that uh, the head of the Department of Public Service um, has not been clear, has not made a clear response. Uh, nothing, really, nothing has happened in the last several years um, around the relay service uh, from the Department of Public Service. We do thank you very much for your testimony. We appreciate it. We'll follow up with it. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I appreciate you having me here. Senator Sheldon. Thank you very much for your That was powerful. I saw that, right? I won't even go there. We're into 726 this year. 426. <laughs> 726. 726, excuse me. You're right. <laughs> um, thank you for having me in to introduce uh, H726. It's a bill that creates a voluntary standard for pollinator friendly solar um, installations. It is a bill that's actually been, it's a three-page bill, but it's been in the making for a couple of years with a group of um, interested, a diverse group of interested environmental um, organizations, including Gun Institute, Audubon, Energy Action Network, UVM, um, Fresh Energy, BHB, REV, and Vermont DEC. They've all collaborated to create this um, standard to um, Essentially, the goal of it is to address, we all pretty much know by now that pollinators are in decline, one of the biggest 
reasons for that decline is loss of habitat. So this is a bill to create, like I said, a voluntary certification that would be administered by the University of Vermont Extension uh, to uh, allow for, I mean, it does two things. One, I guess it creates the standard, and so when you can then make a claim that you're a pollinator-friendly uh, solar installation, um, it actually has a legitimate standard that is evaluated by. Um, other benefits, um, and pollinators and also is good for game birds and birds when you create this habitat. Um, the idea is that you create, you plant native perennial vegetation that's beneficial to those species, and you can claim pollinator friendly only if you, um, you the owner, um, follows the guidelines set forth in this assessment form. I have copies for you all if you're interested in it. It is, uh, like I said, a form that was two years in the making. I think it's important to realize when you're talking about planting and maintaining native perennial uh, vegetation around solar installations, there's also other benefits that can accrue in terms of increasing carbon sequestration in the soil. So it's kind of a win-win-win. You've got a solar installation, and then you have increased habitat, and then you also have improved soil health and carbon sequestration in that soil. So it's, um, like I said, it's a short bill. It has some definitions to help set the frame for who is eligible. And then it sets uh, guidelines for how you can make the claim that you are a pollinator-friendly solar installation. And you do that by developing a site plan. And the site plan then is submitted to the University of Vermont Extension. It's also made available to the public so that they can see you know, the legitimacy of your claim. And. Um, I think there's a typo on page three of the bill, because I think it repeats the same thing twice. But I worked with Audubon Vermont as the lead person communicating with me on developing the bill. And um, that's Jim Shallow. He's, he's back. He's in the nosebleed <laughs> section <laughs> of the room today. Welcome to the week. We live there. <laughs> I know that he and other partners who helped develop this would, would love to come and testify if um, you should take it up. And then I also have um, kind of a constituent, a, a man who lives in Weybridge, has a program called Be the Change, and he would also very much like to come and testify. His name is Mike Kiernan. Uh, is there anything keeping someone from filling out this form now and saying score and say they got a pollinator friendly site right now? Or? Well, I think that there's nothing keeping anyone from doing that, but by having a clearinghouse to keep it, um, I don't know, on the straight and narrow, and the certification, sort of the double check, makes it more legit. Yeah, UVM um, would hold that. So they could change this. They came up with this. They can change it. It's not subject to any rule making. It's whatever UVM comes up with. Right. Well, and this team developed it. Team. Okay. Thanks, Kurt. Oh, what about me? You were after him. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Raise your hand. I got you. Raise my hand. Just let me <laughs> Okay. Amy, I um, sometimes get skipped. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> Amy, um, I had uh, just a little bit of yard in front of the house, and, and um, when I first heard about this a few years ago, I, I let the, um, uh, what do they call it? The, uh, they make like a milk in the in the Milkweed. Milkweed. Um, I let them grow. They've kind of taken over, and I actually have bees on them. Yeah. And so my question is, and I didn't do anything other than stop cutting them. Right. Let them go, and they have taken over. Um, uh, do you have to do anything, or what? If you just let a field go. And, um, um, well, that's a good question. It's also a segue. You remind me that um, there are two other states already doing this: Absolutely. Minnesota and Maryland. Minnesota is the most far along in their program, and in 2016, they had 2,330 acres planted. And um, I've had a similar experience to you, whereas I'm, I, well, it's maybe not as wild as yours, but like, I, the pollinators that are in my garden, just by planting a few particular things around, um, are almost overwhelming. But the interesting thing about the statistic from Minnesota is 
these 2,300 acres represent, if you had a small patch in front of a, more of a, a suburban house, then I'm imagining that you have 1.4 million 6 by 12 gardens. So whereas we've done a good job educating um, residential landowners on becoming pollinator friendly, the goals of this program would be to kind of exponentially expand on the amount of habitat we're able to create. So your question, I mean, you, these are often solar fields. I'm going to take a, a guess at this, but there will be other experts that you can bring in to address it who've developed these standards. But um, in Vermont, if you have a solar field that's in a, a fallow hay field, you're going to have all kinds of species in there. And the goal for this is to really get back to um, non-invasive native species that meet this particular standard for um, being absolutely pollinator friendly. So you think you do have to do some planting? I think so, okay. yes, to convert it back. Okay, I mean, you probably had some milkweeds and, and you let them go. Right, and I, and I probably used to cut them right. along with the, the, the grass. Uh, so just one, um, so my house is actually urban, not so okay. The difference is important. No, when I was <laughs> getting your two locales switched to my head, sorry, you're sitting close to each other. I know we look alike. I have the courage on Carl Robin now, but Mike. Kind of more hair. I was picturing a field in Charlotte when you were talking. Uh -huh. Mike is your turn. <laughs> okay, uh, so what's the benefit of somebody who does get certified in this? Uh, I mean, uh, other than just bragging rights. I think that's the big benefit, and to build momentum around creating this really much needed habitat. Yeah. I think it's finding um, that link. Many customers who care about solar also are going to care about habitat. And it's also taking a fallow, um, often a fallow agricultural field and making it even more beneficial. All right. Um, does this uh, certification and registry exist already, or would it, would it be created for this? Um, that's a great question. Does this exist already? <laughs> Can I pass the torch to someone who might have the answer? Is that all right? If they'll identify themselves. Hi, uh, this is Jim Shell. <laughs> no, I mean, of course, <laughs> managing director at Audubon. Vermont. Thanks. So, so yes, they're uh, not necessarily the registry. We do have the site up and running with extension. We have several producers who have taken the pledge to follow these practices and have gone through the scorecard process. What we're really aiming here to do is create sort of that stamp of approval, so that when the consumer and others hear about this, they know that it's legit. So that's what we're aiming for. Here. Are pollinators active in night? Um, some of them are. Moths, you, think, you know, when you flip that light on in your back porch and get those moths going. Many plants um, are, you know, they are, have adapted to be pollinated by I'm, moths. I'm just, just curious, just as I was going through the draft, um, that it made reference to bats. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which got me thinking of the failing population of bats. Has that been positive for pollinators? Because because is that a, I, I, if it's, I thought you'd have a I'm going to decline to answer. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I'm going to ask around if you want. It's how quickly I can go into the weeds. <laughs> well, well, we have flowers on them. Or just their kind of weeds. <laughs> Flower, flowers. Yeah. Um, my next question was whether there was any discussion in this of uh, fencing and large mesh. Uh, yes, there has been discussion of fencing. Is, it, is that a shut up? No, no, no not at all. <laughs> yeah, we just discussed it a little bit. Um, you could uh, you could have temporary fencing um, in terms of trying to get your plantings going. That's kind of where we were just discussing it. Um, and then I also did have. Do you, does someone else want to, Jim, do you want to talk about fencing, other fencing we could, around um, the whole thing? That, um, Many are fenced. To arrays yes. require fencing. Yes. So, we, I mean, so much of this is site specific. That's part of the reason we have the scorecard, because we recognize that there are different conditions that may need to be met under permits or whatever. So um, that vegetative management plan look at that and that's one of the reasons one like uh, Minnesota and some of the other states the other states that have done this we've been trying to be intentional about thinking about the buffering mm -hmm. around the arrays uh, so that they are planted in a way that's beneficial for the pollinators and birds um, because many times they will just screen them with cedars and you know cedars have some benefit but it's pretty limited so um, in areas of the state where we have fairly rare birds that are using these shrub habitats, we have a great opportunity to use those buffers as a way to enhance that. So incorporating that into the fencing is something that we want to look into as we develop this going forward. But as far as metal fencing, there's no discussion or requirement or 
preference. We have not so. really delved into that. Yeah. Well, is there anything that restricts this now? No, there isn't. I mean, that's what we were talking about. But it does. This provides a standard that then can be used. You get credit for. Correct. Uh, yeah. Right. You can tell people that you've done something right. legit. Right. You have solar and you have pollinators. Right. You're not just on your own claiming it. Some yeah. a third party basically right. verifies that yes, indeed, this is pollinator friendly. Thank you. This is going to be intriguing. <laughs> Great. Thank you. The bees. <laughs> yeah, there you go. This is H476. Is it even fossil fuel? 476. I mean, 746. Hi, I'm Representative Mary Sullivan, the lead sponsor of this um, piece of legislation. And um, it's a short, straightforward bill. I won't call it a simple bill. Um, but um, I think all of us, um, I mean, I think it's important to accept that the fossil fuel age is coming to an end. And I think it's incumbent upon us as legislators to help guide this so it doesn't really destroy our economy and that we don't leave people um, in the future with costs that we've spent today that are that stretch out for 30 years. And um, so this would um, ban the building of fossil fuel infrastructure. And um, when I worked at Burlington Electric Department before I came back here, it seemed like one day I had never heard of, um, of um, heat pumps. Of, um, and then I never stopped hearing about them. The people are really buying them, they're using them, the technology is really coming forward. Um, and uh, really moving strong. And people um, seem to have a commitment of trying to move away from fossil fuel. So this would prevent the building of fossil fuel in infrastructure uh, in the state for all the ones that we have control over. Obviously, FERC um, preempts us in certain areas, and that's federal government, so uh, we can't take control of that. Um, so uh, I really hope you'll look at this bill um, seriously. I think it's important for us to um, kind of guide our economy in the future as we move forward um, and uh, during this time of transition and this time of change. Thank you. Um, I haven't had a chance to digest the, what, what I just read, but the, um, so I, I understand the, the pipeline part of it. Um, in Rutland, there's a, you know, businesses are interested in, in Natural gas island that people where they're supplied by trucks, but then there's an infrastructure developed within a certain area, of a, you know, commercial area. Would that be covered? Um, I, I think it would be. It'd probably be wise to ask ask legislative council that question, but I think it would be. So how would we get around some of these mortgage programs? So like you know, exist, for instance, in St. Albans, I live in a neighborhood that has natural gas that runs through it. And when I was getting, going through one of my first time home buyer loans, I had to hook up to natural gas. It was a requirement of the loan. Um, so building a pipeline, even though it was 20 feet from next to the road to my house, is building fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, have we thought about what the consequence would be? Because a lot of these mortgage programs are federal mortgage programs, and we'd be potentially making home ownership really expensive or un unobtainable for younger Vermonters. Or yeah, I think um, as we, um, I think we, rather than looking back, we have to think of how we build out into the future. Um, I think um, people at this point are thinking of removing what uh, is in the ground, uh, and that pipe is in the ground. Um, but expanding it at this time, I just don't think it's So right. expanding the pipe from the road to my house 20 feet is not, now, well, you um, wouldn't consider that infrastructure growth? The, um, expanding it from, you know. St. Albans to another town. Yeah. Other question? That was quick. Quicker than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> still Thank reading. You very much. Well, and I'm still reading the bill, so uh, not sure what questions I have at this time. Okay. So 
Thank you. My own committee is still so At least it's part of it's deal. Good morning. My name is Patrick Sutton. I'm here this morning on behalf of uh, 350 Vermont, which is an organization that uh, grassroots uh, strives to combat climate change. Uh, can I ask uh, the committee first how much time I should plan for here? Minus. <laughs> <laughs> we're coming closer to sure catching up to that. I thought we were going to do. To I, tell you very, I can be very brief. I think. Um, but I don't want to keep you from lunch. Um, I think we'll so we can go value your testimony first, and we'll worry about lunch second. Okay. If you can keep the content, but make it briefer, that'd be okay too. But yeah, you yeah. I, I'm sorry, I don't have electronic uh, testimony for you this morning. I've been out of the building too much, I guess. Um, but there is type testimony over there. I, would, I want to thank uh, Representative Sullivan and the co-sponsors for pu putting this important bill before you. I want to thank the committee for taking it up. Um, you know, I, I was going to say more flowery and eloquent things this morning that I will skip in the interest of time. But, but the reality is, you all know as well as we do, that climate change is not just coming. Climate change is here. Um, and. We see it at the national level in Vermont. Uh, you know, Americans are dying in mudslides. When, when did we ever expect to see this kind of thing happen? The, the cost for the, for the natural disasters in the last year, I read recently, was $300 billion in this country alone. Where is that money coming from in the future? And the problem is we are only at the beginning of this, as you all know, a trouble with irregular weather, irregular snowfall, irregular uh, weather for farming. And uh, believe it or not, we are still paying for uh, Tropical Storm Irene. I was the commissioner of mental health the year after that storm. And we thought we had come up with a system that would replace the old one. And what we didn't appreciate, it turns out, is just how much of a shock to our mental health system that flood was. And so here we are six years later, and the governor's talking about building more mental health beds. The point is obvious that the, the price we are going to pay for climate change is enormous, and it's happening now. It is only going to get worse. So we believe this bill makes a very important statement. It put, basically puts a stake in the ground and says we're not going back. We're only going forward. That we need to move faster than ever towards 100% renewables. And you know, it was very interesting to hear testimony earlier uh, in the day from the folks from the Housing Conservation Board or the uh, housing people talk about what, everything they're doing for uh, get heat pumps into their buildings and thermal energy and all that. That's great. That's what we should be doing. That's what we should be investing in. That's the economic development that this state should be focused on, not more fossil fuels. Um, I, I have to say that this is a change that we can make that makes, again, a very strong statement, and it doesn't involve raising anybody's taxes. It's, you know, there's a lot of other issues that that we're going to have to pay for. This one doesn't. Um, and I would also argue that this bill is not unlike the bill that the legislature passed uh, some years ago, I think five or six years ago, to ban fracking in Vermont. It's the same idea. We know it's harmful. We know there's no good side to it for us. Why don't we just stop? Why don't we say no and continue to do the more positive uh, work on, on renewables? Obviously, the focus in the bill, when you get to read it and study it a little bit, the focus in the bill is large infrastructure projects. Uh, to Representative uh, Parent, this question, I actually think the, the bill exempts what you were talking about. If the pipeline is there and you're building a house, uh, an extension to your house is permitted. I, I think we're trying to recognize that we don't need to disrupt our current systems in our current structure that much, what we just need to do is stop expanding it. We need to make that decision and go forward otherwise. But I think, you know, the point is, as Representative Sullivan said, this is uh, a short bill, it's not a simple bill. Um, there, are, there are some complications as you start to think about how would this actually work, what is your real definition of infrastructure, um, and, and we think that's a great opportunity for this committee to talk those things through and make the decision that's best for Vermonters. So we very much would like the committee to take additional testimony. There's tremendous interest in this bill in the state. One thing uh, 350 Vermont has done is started a town meeting day resolution campaign 
along the same lines, basically making the same point. We have 38 towns where, where this question is going to be either on the ballot or on the warning. I think that, and, and that was with only a few months worth of work. So I think there's tremendous interest out there. The fact that you have so many people in the room today tells you that there's strong interest. And, and frankly, if we wanted to, there would have been 50 people in the room, which I don't think makes any sense right now. But some of you may have. <laughs> may have exactly. Yeah, we can only get to mid 30s. <laughs> some of you may have heard from your constituents already about this bill. I predict to you that you're going to hear more. There is broad based, widespread support for this bill and just making the statement that we're not going back, we're going forward, and the time has come. Warren. Uh, so we had a bill presentation on uh, Burlington Electric and District Heat, and I believe a large percentage of that would come for natural gas, and I don't know if that might require a bigger pipe to go to Burlington Electric. If, if it needs a bigger pipe to get there, would that be increasing the uh, infrastructure? Uh, the best answer I can give you right now is that that's what we need to flesh out in the legislative process. I, you know, you'd probably get five or six different answers in this room if we asked everybody what the right approach would be with it. But it's really, of course, it's always up to you to decide what the definition is and what the provisions would be. And so, um, you know, from my perspective, I would probably say no, but to the degree that it's really just uh, taking advantage of existing infrastructure, then why not? Um, and so that I'm not prepared to answer your question okay. in detail at this time. But. I mean, the argument could be made since just about all of Burlington is natural gas. The fact that they're switching over to this cogeneration biomass, they would be overall reducing the amount of natural gas because they're going to get a lot of heat from bio, but it may require additional infrastructure if they need to fire up another up a boiler for it. So the, I. Yeah, I think it's a great question, and we can get back to you about that. We yeah, can look into okay. it some more. The bill uh, talks about repair and maintenance of existing systems right. being permitted. So the question I is, see. where does that fall okay. in, the, in the debate? But thank you. Great question. Right. Thanks, Jim. Um, thank so, you know, the final uh, points that I would just like to make is that um, it, 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 the, the time really has come. You know, I, I, w I had the, the good fortune yesterday to go cross-country skiing. It was a beautiful day. I'm sure you were all here working very hard, but I was out skiing. Beautiful winter day in Vermont. Blue sky, sunny, six inches of new snow. I can't, and I had a great time, but I can't, every time I go out my door and do that, I can't help but think, my kids are not going to be see as many of these days. And my grandchildren, the day may come when they're not going to see any of those days. That's what's happening with climate change. That's the human impact part of it, never mind the huge cost that we're, that we're facing, which is coming at us like a freight train, and we are not ready for it. Vermont has done great things, but we have not even kept up with our own goals in reducing carbon in this state. No matter what we've done, we have to do more. And I think this sends an incredibly strong message to everybody who's involved that we're committed and we're not going back. Thank you very much. If, if you have the time, I'd like to ask Rachel Smoker to come up and just talk for a couple of minutes about the uh, the current dangers and the current problems with our current system. Okay, I've got a question for you. Yeah, here. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, this is more of a comment, I guess. And, and the way one of the economic benefits I see, I actually see see from this is the fact that uh, any build out beyond what is currently been approved. Uh, has the potential of stranding costs, which are subsidized by repairs. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> because the infrastructure is amortized over many, many years, decades, and if the demand for the fossil fuels decreases as a result of renewable energy and energy transformation, then those costs can't be recovered in the future. So. Uh, it's an excellent point. You know, once we build the pipeline, it's there for 30 years, and it will get used. People will use it because of the investment. So I think your point is well taken. Would it be all right to ask? Uh, so this? Do you have any other questions here first? No. Yes, please do. Okay, great job. Yeah. So I'm feeling some combination of
low blood sugar and low oxygen in the room here. <laughs> but um, that's okay. High temperatures are going to help you again. <laughs> <laughs> that too. But um, I'm Rachel Smoker. I'm a co-director of an organization called Biofuel Watch that works on land climate issues, um, mostly at the international level. And um, in the state of Vermont, most of the work that I've been doing recently has been focused on the pipeline, the, the gas pipeline that uh, Vermont Gas is building through the state that I know you're all well aware of. And obviously this bill would, you know, among other things, um, put the kibosh on further expansion of that pipeline. And we know that ultimately that was meant to go down to Rutland and, and the initial plans to connect up uh, across the lake to the IP uh, paper plant and also we know that in the industry's bigger vision this was ultimately aiming towards export markets and that's where the natural gas industry is, is looking. And Vermont is really viewed as being something of an energy corridor uh, for um, getting gas and energy through to places like uh, New York City and so on and beyond and all, also um, linking into some of the other big infrastructure that's already in place in the, in, in the New England states. And one of the things, you know, I think um, we've already heard a lot about the, the, the concerns about uh, fossil fuel infrastructure build out in terms of climate and what it means for our children, what it means for our grandchildren. But there are also some very much more immediate uh, dangers and risks to fossil fuel infrastructure. We can look at what happened in San Bruno some years ago when the P, I believe it was PG&E uh, pipeline exploded, 38 homes were uh, destroyed and eight people were killed. We can look at what happened in Southern California this past summer where a pipeline uh, well actually was leaking and contaminating um, communities all around. Here in Vermont we're actually facing the same thing. We have dug into the construction of this Addison Natural Gas Pipeline in great detail with multiple public records requests and intervening in before the Public Utilities Commission on several different fronts. Um, and what we have learned is that the construction of this pipeline has been um, reckless, it's, to put it mildly. And I, I'm not going to go into all the details of everything we found because everything is still in process, but looking in, at the records from uh, that we do have, we know that Vermont Gas has gone before the Public Utilities Commission recently and said, oops, we didn't bury the pipeline deep enough in a swamp in New Haven. Now, the only reason they went before the, uh, and admitted to the shallow burial in that location, we believe, is because Lawrence Shelton, who's sitting here, took some photos of the pipeline sitting just a few inches below the surface, knowing that under the Velco wires, which is, introduces a, cor a corrosion risk, the pipeline was supposed to be buried four foot deep. We delivered that to PIMSA, to the federal authorities, along with a whole list of concerns that we had about the lack of comprehensive written specifications for the contractors to follow about issues with um, um, not having proper qualified, qualified workers on site uh, and a whole list of other things that we delivered to PIMSA and PIMSA came to the state and responded to our concerns and opened an investigation. And it just very recently, uh, they reported back in to, uh, to the state on what they had found from their investigation. Vermont got zero out of four points, zero points in their review of compliance and following through on regulatory actions for uh, uh, the oversight of construction of this pipeline in our state. Could, now, what could you tell, me, tell us what PIMSA is? Oh, sorry, <laughs> Pipeline Hazardous Material Safety Administration. So that's the federal pipeline oh, regulatory and oversight body. Now PIMSA says- Do you want to keep going with your question, Mike? Uh, no, that's, that was my question. <laughs> Among other things, we have, um, uh, we've intervened in this case on the shallow burial. We have uh, brought to the attention of the Public Utilities Commission that the depth of burial issue is very closely tied to the issue of whether there were proper supports put under the pipeline as required by the specifications, both the federal specifications and the state certificate of public good. The state required much higher standards than the federal uh, standards. The certificate of public good was meant to enhanced the, the federal standards are considered minimum, the absolute bare minimum you must abide by, and the state of Vermont required something much more stringent than that. That certificate of public good has been 
not honored um, as, it, as it should have been, let's just say. So we have brought into the whole equation the issue of lack of padding and support under the pipeline. Now, Vermont Gas has admitted that in certain locations they forgot to put the padding in. In this swamp, they couldn't really. It was too mucky and oozy. Uh, but padding and support and under the pipeline, the pipeline, there are very specific specifications how that's supposed to be done. Sand uh, around the pipeline, it has to be compacted. You can imagine you're putting a pipeline in the trench and there's, you know, what's under the pipeline, there's what's up around the sides of the pipeline, and there's what's over the pipeline, and all of this <coughs> is specified in great detail. Um, and we know that those, those were not followed. We know that they essentially changed the specifications in 2016 construction had been going on excuse me, for quite a while already, uh, some uh, inspector said, hey, you're not supposed to put the pipeline directly on the bottom of the trench. And they were responded said, saying, oh yeah, we can do that. That's part of what we're allowed to do in this. And this said, no, actually, you're not allowed to do that. What does that tell us? It tells us that prior to the time that that inspector stepped up to the ball, they had been laying it on the bottom of the trench without. This adds considerably to the corrosion risks for the pipeline and ultimately the, the major source of problems with pipelines exploding and leaking comes from risks of corrosion which can be introduced from various different things. Right. Yeah, so um, who does the inspections? So <laughs> it depends what you're inspecting. So there are inspections that the contractor is responsible. There are, they hire an inspection uh, company to come in and do inspections. The Department of Public Service does some inspections. And so on. So there's a, there's a lot of complexity to that. I can't just give you. So in the areas person. where it wasn't very deep enough, um, what has the Public Utility Commission come back with? The Public and Utilities Commission, thank you for asking that, has come back opening an investigation, an independent uh, investigation into the depth <coughs> of burial in that swamp, which we are very good reason to think is not the only place that there's problems. Um, but also uh, under streams, because in the initial certificate of public good, um, you know, these there are many, many different testimonies and, and pieces to how that whole process, Act 248 process, went through. But among them was that <coughs> under streams with fluvial erosion hazard, they would go uh, uh, using horizontal drilling under certain numbers of streams, and in, in open trench crossings, they would go under the bottom of the stream bed at seven foot depth below the bottom of the stream bed. And this is to protect against uh, erosion from flooding and so on. But as time went on, um, fewer and fewer streams were qualified for this seven foot of burial. And in the end, we, we are seeing that in some of the open trench crossings, they achieved five foot of cover. And they are saying, we only had to do three because that was the PIMSA federal minimum requirement. So. This, there's a lot more complexity to that than I'm conveying very quickly, um, but again, the, the erosion, if I can be punny, uh, of the initial intent and uh, of, of how streams were going to be crossed uh, was eroded. <laughs> And so that hasn't been resolved. And that's that's part of the, this independent survey that has been that the PUC has right. asked for is under stream beds as well as in this swamp area. Okay. Know. And when have they projected that that will be completed? That inspection. It is that out. Year? You know, a request for bidding or contract, whatever the term is. Um, and I believe that that period just closed, which means they maybe have already contracted it. But my guess is that they're waiting for the weather to be more amenable for that to happen. And we are trying now to push this case um, further open. So there's the, the issues of shallow depth in this one area. Maybe it's other areas. Maybe it's streams also. How about the issue of padding and support under and around? And what kind of, uh, what places we know, for example, they've told us that they installed canusa sleeves, which are a cover that you use to repair coating damage over the welds. Uh, and they had problems with those, and they had 260 that they dug out and 66 that were already buried and are still remaining there. Um, we know that, um, uh, anyway, there's, there's just, you know, a lot of different issues. They had been lack of records about what coatings had been used on the pipe in certain areas, um, and that, again, is it's buried, you know, this in the ground. And now it's a matter of going back, and it's unfortunate that this is happening at this late stage. But 
you know, the thing about this is that uh, this pipeline is passing through people's yards, and it's passing through our communities. It's passing through the public park in Heinsberg. It's passing through uh, areas in, in towns where it's close to schools. It's passing through my friend Jane, uh, who's here with us today, uh, through her yard, just a couple hundred feet in what is defined as the incineration zone. Uh, and people are faced with, you know, eminent domain, have these pipelines come through their property, and I'll bet you that 99.9% .9 of them have not a clue about the ways in which the, the, uh, the construction of this pipeline did not comply, was not done properly, and this is sitting now in their backyards. And they don't know it. They don't even know what's happening. Maybe it's <laughs> it's a little better that they don't, so they don't sit, they, you know lie awake at night. But this is another additional part of the build out of fossil fuel infrastructure that is very real for people who live uh, close to it. And we have a question. One more question. Uh, you know, do you happen to have the docket number of the investigation or, or of the? Yes, I can get it, or we can find it really yeah. quickly. It's seventeen three five five zero, I think. I, mean, I can. I have it on my computer. I'll get it. You can get it to them after. Any <coughs> questions? Send it to Mr. Bailey. Thank you very much, you for talking quickly, and Patrick for giving up on his time and, <laughs> and then get us back to the schedule. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming. I just want to make a comment for the record that uh, the pipeline does pass through the uh, properties of some of my constituents in Heinsburg, and uh, I know they are concerned about the pot potential uh, liability. Okay. Thank you. What do you think of